Let's take a little trip. 19th century London was not an easy place to live. Much of the population found themselves living in abject poverty in overcrowded slums with horrendous sanitation. The average life expectancy was less than 50 years. The reason for this is because there was regular epidemics. During this time, there were four cholera outbreaks. Now, common knowledge at the time was that cholera was an airborne disease. It came from the cemetery where, 100 years prior, people had been victims of the bubonic plague were buried. Now, a man named John Snow disagreed. John was convinced that cholera was actually coming from contaminated drinking water. Now, no one really believed him that this wasn't a popular theory. So he created a map. First, he mapped out the locations of all the drinking wells. And then, he mapped out the locations of all of the people that had died due to cholera. Now, very quickly, he started to see a trend. And this trend became more and more obvious. He identified one specific well where many of the victims who had died from cholera had been getting their water. So he created a narrative around this, based on fact. He created a narrative that resonated with local city officials, so much so that they decided to close down the well and they actually contained the outbreak. Now, John's classic study is one of the best examples for understanding and resolving social problems using spatial analysis, data visualization, and maps. Now, we've continued to use this strategy and these methods for storytelling and creating narratives today. This is that same map, the same data, recreated actually just a few days ago using modern mapping technology. Our abilities to tell stories are increasing at an exponential rate due to technological advances. The ease at which we can use this technology, the increased access that we have to this technology, and the power of this technology. Now, this map shows us the wealth of information that we can derive from place. Understanding place is powerful. So if I tell you that I'm from Colorado, which I am, there might be some images that pop in, up into your mind. You might think, OK, this guy grew up going to the mountains every weekend, maybe hanging out with people like this. <laughs> may or may not be true. But if I were to tell you that I was from Miami, which I'm not, you might get a different image in your mind. Perhaps one that's a little more elegant, maybe a little more stylish. <laughs> we assign meaning to place, whether we try to or not. We, our understanding of a location changes the way we perceive that place. And maps allow us to do that much more accurately. While it's true I do have a friend or two that looked like that other guy, that doesn't mean that everyone from Colorado will hang down the mountain and fall into the snow, right? So maps allow us to get a much more realistic, fact-based understanding of place, and that is powerful. That's the power of location data. That's the power of telling a full story with all of the information to allow us to achieve a full and complete understanding of the complex realities an understanding of place, an understanding of what location means in different um, areas of the world, and understanding these complex realities as they exist across different geographies. So we can tell stories with maps. The historical, political, social, economic, personal ties that people have to places are usually at the center of stories. 
And we can create maps with this data. Right? And I know data sometimes is not the most exciting word that makes people want to jump and scream and get excited. But the good news is, is data is everywhere. We create data. You all create data. We're creating data right now. When you use social media, when you use your phone, when you buy something, you're creating data. And more and more data has a location component to it, which allows us to easily leverage that and better understand the world that we live in. So as individuals, we create data, but cities and organizations and companies also create data. And five years ago, New York City decided to open up that data. And by open it up, I mean allow citizens and normal people to access that information creating a common language between government and people, working with the same information. And so, open data can cover everything from education to crime to security to environment to climate. And so I'll give you a simple example of how we can turn that data into insight, into a narrative, into a story, and how we can own that data and tell our own story. So if we go to that website, the Open Data New York City website, we download a simple data set, this one being of trees in New York City. We can scroll around and look at and read. Maybe there's 100, 200,000 rows of information there. It's very hard to actually get something out of that. It's a little overwhelming. So step one is to open up this data and increase access to this data. But step two is to create tools that allow us, to allow everyone, the ability to learn from that data, to inform our decision making with that data, and to create our own narratives, to create our own change, and to support our own causes that are most important to us. So once we visualize this data, this is the same data in a visual representation on a map. Very quickly, we can see the different species of trees that exist in New York City, the sizes, the distribution of trees across New York City. This is a very simple example. A more complex example would be looking at the open data that shows all the traffic accidents that occur in New York City over time. This allows individuals and citizens a seat at the table when talking about addressing problems as they pertain, in this case, to traffic accidents. We can understand where they're happening, where problem areas are, and we can be better informed to propose solutions to those problems. And more generally, we can contribute to the ongoing discussions happening in these spaces. The full potential of data is realized with a combination of these open source mapping they give us insight into the where, to the place, to the locations. And they allow us to tell stories. And stories are something that we have always told. Right? We've used many different methods to tell stories, whether it be spoken word, written, stories of conflict, of successes, of failures. We do it with drawings and images and movies, song and dance. The first stories were carved into cave walls. And just with a simple image, we can gain insight into how people lived, what their circumstances were like. And now we tell stories in a more sophisticated way, where we are enabled to include irrefutably true data and facts into our narratives, like this one that shows the situation of deforestation across the world. And I think that every, I strongly believe that every successful social justice movement has had one key component in common, a strong narrative, a strong story, because if you want to change something, 
You have to tell the story of the actual reality first before you know what you're going to change, how you're going to change it, and what you ultimately want to arrive to. Women did not achieve the right to vote by holding meetings with other women who also wanted to achieve the right to vote. In some sense, maybe they did. They organized, they mobilized. But the biggest challenge was to create a narrative that resonated with the same people who stood in their way to vote, right? Who were the oppressors. They had to create a narrative that convinced them that it was in everyone's best interest that they voted, that they had something to contribute, that they deserved to contribute, that they had a right to sit at the table and be politically represented. Apartheid South Africa would not have achieved the social and political changes that it did without winning over some hearts and minds along the way. Black South Africans needed their white counterparts to understand their strife, to understand their struggles, to understand them on a personal level so that they could evoke some compassion, some logic, some reason. So for the past year, I've been working in an amazing capacity that allows me to engage with individuals and organizations all over the world telling stories, using data, using technology to give voice to the voiceless faces, to the invisible, and to bring issues to the forefront that are very easily swept under the rug, sometimes by the powers that be. So I'd like to share some of those stories with you now. And I'd like to start with the anti-addiction mapping and I think they really embody where we are as a society and how we are collectively leveraging this technology. This is a group of volunteers, they're a mapping collective, that fully depend on maps to tell their stories. They tell stories of displacement, forced evictions, gentrification. Usually the people that are being displaced don't have a voice. They might be immigrants. English might not be their first language. They might not have a full understanding of their rights as a tenant. This makes them easy victims. But luckily, we have the power of data to tell these stories and to bring them more into the mainstream. You can't change something if you don't know it exists. You have to literally put it on the map. So some of their work shows correlations between, in this case, Airbnb and evictions. We might have opinions about what that correlation may or may not be, but let's put the facts on a map. Let's visualize it and tell a story and let the truth surface naturally. The Environmental Investigation Agency tells stories for a specific purpose, to raise awareness. There's lots of different reasons why we tell stories. Maybe to mobilize people, maybe to raise awareness, to entertain. And these people are raising awareness around illegal poaching, but they're doing it in a way that puts facts and location at the center of that story, which empowers people to follow the routes that this takes. From where the animal is killed to where the ivory is sold, and everyone in between, the customs agency that looked the other way, the person that took the bribe, this brings accountability. This empowers an international community to bring certain perpetrators to justice. It's much more than just a nice map to look at. Jon Snow resolved a social problem in London 150 years ago using a map. And today we're faced with new health epidemics. The most recent one that I had the pleasure of working on was Zika, that we're still working on, of course, and trying to understand these new epidemics as they come up. When new outbreaks happen, we're now able to track, visualize, and analyze that in real time, telling that story as it unfolds, allowing us to 
mobilize resources and people to certain areas before the problem even gets there. I have to say this is definitely my favorite project because it embodies everything that I love about maps, everything I love about democratizing access to this technology. In Kibera is one of the largest informal settlements in the world and the largest in Africa, located in Kenya. In 2009, this community of 250,000 people did not exist on the map. It was a blank spot. It didn't even look like a park. It just wasn't there. 250,000 people, invisible, marginalized. And each individual has a story. Imagine how many stories are in that community that are not being told. So thanks to OpenStreetMap, which is an international volunteer, nonprofit mapping organization that allows people to edit maps and put themselves and their communities on the map, we now see that in this zone that wasn't even represented, of people that were invisible, there's actually a lot going on in there. There's a rich culture, there's creativity, there's places of worship, there's business, ingenuity. And now these people are not only mapping themselves, they're telling their own stories through this project. And so when a problem does arise, they're in a much better position to address it and to get the support they need in order to overcome it. Here in New York City, neighborhoods are changing, the city's evolving, <coughs> and anytime that happens, there's winners and there's losers, unfortunately. We know that. I'm talking to a, a room full of New Yorkers, you know that. But to what extent is up for question, right? We know there's things going on, but we don't know exactly where or to what extent someone's being negatively affected, to what extent someone else is, is gaining from this. The Citizen Housing and Planning Council takes publicly available data over time and visualizes exactly how these changes are manifesting. How are the demographic compositions in Brooklyn changing? Who's being forced out? Who's coming in? Achieving a fuller understanding of the story that is New York is in part achieved through this technology, through these stories. So I know that everybody here has an, a story. Everyone has an individual experience. Everyone is tied to a certain place, whether it be where you study, where you're from, where your family's from, where you want to be, where you have been. So tell those stories. You'll all go out and continue to make your mark on the world and impact your communities and impact the world. So do so in a creative way. Do so in a way that's impactful. Do so in, in a new way. So think about what the stories that you really care about are. Think about how you want to tell them. Be creative, be thoughtful, and tell your story.